Daniel. So glad to see you. How are you? Come on in. Um, come on in. Sorry, it's like insane. Thank you so much, Jill, for. I, I mean, I love your home so much. Thank you so much. Well, he knows that. No. Um, I love it. I told you guys, like, her whole life is branded, like. She knows her brand. I never say brand. Well, she gives me these shows. Well, I think summer. I How long have you guys are. lived here? Um, ten years. Wow, that's so beautiful. I'm never leaving. I'm like putting my dead body in a coffin. Oh, like art that's really made cool. with currency. Okay, I'm nervous. Really? Why? I don't we've, know. We've sat here a million times with like a bottle of wine, though. It's usually at night. I know. Testing, testing, one, two, syphilis, syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> okay welcome to rodeo after hours i am so intimidated to be doing this why with... why the fuck are you intimidated you're like a rock star <laughs> with jill kargman actress producer writer author i don't know probably singer i, I don't know what <laughs> oh my god in the shower tiktoker um, I have 36 your, followers. And what, no, my kids like booted me off TikTok. I don't think it's my medium. Okay, well, you do have quite a following on tic, on Instagram. But and who's your? What's the per personality that you do? Is it Daniela? Oh, it's Daniela. I have a few. I have like Eastern European person who is a friend of Melania Trump, lived oh, yes. in Slovenia. I have Daniela, who's a mom who's like obsessed with working out and was like bitching the whole pandemic. I have a, a character I did at a cabaret show that was the French woman oh. that I know who is very, nothing bothers her. Oh, I don't think I've seen this one. Yeah. Um, but so it's crazy that, okay, we met in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, we took a secret trip when <laughs> no one was supposed to travel, but we were like, fuck this, we're doing it. But we were basically quarantined. On yeah, premise. we were quarantined. We couldn't leave. Um, so we were all stuck on the hotel premise. So we met because there were like 20 of us. Yeah. And I was applying to business school. And here okay, we are. That's not how we met. Let me explain okay, how we met. Actually, yes. Tell the okay, story. So her family was sitting next to my family and everyone kind of, you know, you like track people around a resort like White Lotus style. Like you see who everybody is. And it was very it's few people. So, true. so then this guy is on the dance floor with this chick who starts dry fucking him, humping. Her legs are wrapped around his waist and they are grinding yeah. like literal dirty dancing yes. style yes. and I needed a witness like I had my husband and my kids and we were already agog but once I saw your family noticing the dry hump I was like they're my friends so we were like can you guys believe this and so we became friends because of dry fuckers that is it turns out in this like whole sequence of events we stalked and like got really to know stalked we stalked them and got to know them they met on an app and met in the Four Seasons yes. Resort and they, they she they traveled or like a plane was and they sent. Had, and they had a whole story that like they f f met on the island right, and but fell in love. Lie. But that right, was a but, lie. But actually they were like sexting on Tinder, Grindr. And like there was an intercontinental. Like, everybody that? There was an intercontinental like. Because I think like the whole love boat. I'm dating myself. But it was like a show in the 80s where people like start making out on a cruise. But like yeah. it felt more cinematic and romantic that they were you know, seduced by the island and each other yes. when in fact yes. they were on grinder, like yeah. probably sending dick and box picks. <laughs> that is how we bonded. That's how we bonded. We Sometimes. uncovered the mysteries of the world yeah. together. Um, thing was, was we were like literal island Nancy Drews trying to figure out yeah. what the fuck was going on because yeah. it was so they were shiat fiasco. Yeah, like and nothing blackout. gets and nothing gets by us. We yeah. did figure it out. And it's not Vegas. It's not like what happens in Nevis stays in Nevis. It comes right to New York. And it was like <laughs> we did like deep Instagram stocks and sent each other pictures and it was yeah. wild. It was So we are watching you. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> Rear view mirror. Yeah. True. Um, okay, so here we are. Fast forward. I went to business school. We started rodeo. And obviously, the, over the last... So you were doing your applications there, oh, oh, yes. and now you're graduated. So I'm it's graduated. like the circle of life. Yes. And I've gotten to know your family. I'm so excited to have you today. And the most creative person I probably know... 
okay, you got to get out Told more, Told you she's bad at taking compliments. No, I'll take a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. But you are. You're so um, nice. And I feel, is, is it true that Odd Mom Out is probably like the big break? At the- For acting, yes, because I started acting at 40, but I had been writing since call actually starting in college I was I was writing for Vogue my senior year and then I had written books all of which had been optioned for for film and TV but none were made and I was so naive in the beginning I was like my book was optioned and got champagne and was so excited and I thought that meant it was going to be a movie but like movie studios buy five times as many things as they intend to produce so it wasn't until like years later that my book Momzilla was the basis for Odd Mom Out Okay. Yeah. I know that cover because I worked on your website. At, like, oh, yes. Picture. Yes, <laughs> so, exactly. Okay. So Momzilla was the like the precipice of Odd Mom Out. Yes. Yes. And actually what happened was I had written an essay collection um, called Sometimes I Feel Like a Nut. And it was the first time I'd ever done nonfiction, like about myself and writing really honestly. And I, I realized like all my novels felt kind of fake like I was hiding behind characters and I felt so much more into writing about real real shit and um then I went to my publisher and I said I really want to do another essay collection and they were like so no actually like it didn't sell as well as your fiction and I said what do you mean it was like a New York Times bestseller it was Wall Street Journal bestseller and the audiobook did great and they're like yeah in that category but it actually didn't sell nearly as well as your novels so we want you to write another novel and I said well because I'd heard actors say like one for them and one for me like I'll do a a sell out like hookery studio movie but then I want to do the cool independent movie so I was like can I do that and they're like still no you we don't have any interest in your essay so I felt sort of defeated and rather than shit out a novel that felt like pressure and would take me just more time and I I just didn't want to do that but I wanted to be working part-time so I took a job as a copywriter at Ogilvy and I was writing like literally pad commercial like tampons any there was a lot of guys and I did like the female shit so I was writing for poise and whatever all of these like female brands and um ironically going quote off the path and doing something like that I thought was sort of a step backwards um propelled me forward because I met the producers they were like really big commercials producers of commercials like big budget coca-cola and they did you know all these like chain restaurants and they were like you're funny you could you should do a show you know and they really encouraged me and it turned out one of the guys his wife had read my books and so they sold Odd Mom out. They they made that happen. Wow. And I wouldn't have known them unless I was doing sort of what I thought was like a banal, shitty copywriting job. I love that. I feel like there's such like weird winding of, of life that yeah. like is actually it's not happening linear. like for a reason. Right. You might feel like, oh no, my career's in the shitter and I'm taking a step backwards and this like sucks and I've been demoted. But that's not true. It can yeah. that you can go back like five steps backwards, which gets you on the catapult that throws yeah. you ten steps forward. And I also think it's a lesson of like really following what you love and like what you believe in. Because, right, and like, not doing the that's hooker gonna stuff. Shine. Yeah, get- I mean, I was a hooker. Like I was doing it for the paycheck and also to get out of the house three I mean, days a week. Aren't we all? But like- but I. I didn't want to whore myself in some in like a medium like to be advertising admits to its whoreness. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like yes, I didn't mind grabbing Michaels for that, yeah. but I didn't want to put my name on a book that my heart wasn't in. Yeah, and that is something I have to say, and we won't make this all compliments, but something I admire maybe most about you is that you are able to just like always be so authentically you, and you know empower the people that you like you're your voice is standing for I mean some of that comes with age like I'll be honest I starting acting at 40 is super different than like these kids I see who are 20 and getting hate and I don't think I could have handled that so well like I don't know that I I have like balls of steel and I don't care I have like the thickest skin ever but Instagram was created when I was already a grown-ass woman like I don't think it's as easy for young young people I guess like I just feel like you're so like radical and like not giving a fuck of like yeah I definitely you're don't not give a shit like, but I'm, I'm 48 the, but you're, do you but, know what I'm saying there, like, but other people that have your like you know s- 
you know, reach are not, you know, like having a voice that is, you know, standing for good and what's right and in a way that like is so powerful. Not that I'm seeing as much. Like, do you see yeah, no, a lot of people are scared. I get messages all the time of people being like, you say what you think and I'm, I'm too scared or I agree, but I could never post that right. or whatever it is. People but like I don't worried about getting canceled. Like, I feel well, like I, this actually something. started when my show, my show's now on Peacock and I think I signed like a morality clause or something. Like I, I'm not supposed to do certain things, um, which most of them are, I agree with like whatever yeah. they say with that. But like I, sometimes I just, you, you have to be outspoken in what you believe in. Otherwise you're like a pussy and I'd rather be hated by a lot of people and loved by some people than like kind of liked by everybody and be an inch deep. It like, yeah. a, just like, I, I think we just had this conversation at my apartment. Yeah. I don't mind. Like yeah. I don't not, I'm not for everyone. Yeah. And so let's talk about odd man amount. Cause okay. I feel like, you, so you were, I, that's interesting to hear that you felt like this was the first time, like you were really not hiding behind a character and like watching it. I like was always wondering like, oh, I wonder if that's like, well, that, that was some- more like my essay collection. And then oh, okay. Momzilla's was in fact a, a novel at first. Funny. No, not at all. But then the irony is that once Odd Mom Out came out, it came out, then they, they were like, hi, can you write another essay collection? So Odd Mom Out like gave me the license to then write more essays. And I've been writing nonfiction ever since. I mean, sometimes I do like magazine articles and things like that, that are about other people. But like the essays I write are all, like through the prism of my own okay. instead of a character. Gosh, I need to read um, that. But no, I think, uh, I think Odd Mom Out was sort of me at 28. Mm-hmm. It's like a version of me. Because now I don't really care. But when you have little kids, you, f- you care too much. You're very vulnerable. I felt like I was doing everything wrong. And there's I don't read parenting books because I had a great childhood. So I, th- I feel like I have really good instincts with my kids. But there were there were like these mom clicks and it felt like high school again and I had no friends with kids like none my Mm -hmm. friends were dancing on tables at bungalow eight and like blowing a French auto mechanic like I swear I had no friends with kids so I had to sort of make these single serving friends at the playground and shitting out a kid at the same time is not the basis for a friendship but because New York is made of a lot of settlers there's natives like me and then there's commuters settlers my dad's a settler but like people make friends right but you're a New Yorker now as is my dad but I feel like people make friends through the kids a lot yeah and they see their kids school as almost like a place to fish for friendships yeah. and you know some of the private schools are like country clubs like they they yeah. and that's I didn't I did not have the bandwidth for that no. so that was really where I felt very fish out of water I felt very other a lot of the moms were super decked out I I had Sadie at 28 we had no money I felt like Urban Outfitters like vomited on me like I look like shit every day and I didn't have staff you know like people would say where's your staff or your staff I'm like staff like you're looking at it (laughs) so I had spit up on me like certain aesthetic things of just being a stay-at-home mom so um I just felt very like cut and pasted into that world so in fact odd mom out was you know as you're saying it really was the real me because but it was me from 12 years prior right that's awesome. So like there were all like scenes where like you would like dance with your kids in your underwear. Like, oh yeah, I, that was real. <laughs> yeah. Like, that was I, real. I, f- I feel like I really did like get a view inside to like you when you were like when your kids were younger. Yeah. They had a really fun time. I feel like, you know, those were great years, but I am not one of those moms that says to women your age, like enjoy it while you can little kids, little problems. Cause that's a load of shit. All these people said that to me. And they're like, just wait, big kids, big problems. They're piling into a car with a drunk driver. And I'm like, well, mine aren't like it's pay now or pay later. If you're putting in the time when they're little, they're not slamming the door in your face and calling you a cunt. Like it's just, I've seen the moms who kind of farm out everything Mm -hmm. and they have more distance. I'm very close with my kids. Um, but you know, I was not, I can't lie to you and say like, I was so happy those years. Hashtag blessed. Like I, I knew I was lucky. I knew I was lucky to have kids, but I was exhausted. My marriage was like strained having three kids in four years. I felt like I would cry for no reason. I would say to Harry, like I went to good schools too and you don't wipe ass and I'm changing all the diapers and like I'm drowning in my life. Like those were really hard years for me. 
And um, I wanted the show to kind of reflect some of that and not sugarcoat it. Because I feel like in the age of Instagram, all these millennial moms are like, look how perfect my kids yeah. are. They're not posting like the screaming and crying yeah. and the tantrums. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, exactly. They're not like posting when they have their breakdowns at night. Some are, though. I think there's a changing of the tide. I think some are getting more yeah. real about it. Well, let's hope Luckily. So. so. So when your kids were younger, you were doing like more of the writing and it was when they were older that you, you, that yeah, mom it's funny. Out. Honestly, Lindsay, like I, when I had three there the, in the pilot of Odd Mom Out, there's a study that's real where she's like mother's OD on touch. Cause you feel like everyone wants you and is touching you and there's little hands all over you and your body's literally not your own when you're pregnant or nursing or whatever. I don't nurse. I bottle feed, but then you're supposed to like have sex while you're obese and like trying to, the whole thing was just, I wanted to be alone. So writing books was really the perfect career for me because I I could just like lock myself in a room for, it was my bedroom, but I would, I had a, like a TV dinner stand, like the tiniest table possible with my laptop where I wrote Momzilla's. Um, And I feel like I just could, could sequester. But then when your kids grow up, they go to school, they have their own friends, they have play dates, then I was like a kind of lonely. And even now I find myself alone all the time. And the writer's room of I'm, I'm Out was like the perfect next chapter for me because I was with all these fun, super funny people. And uh, most were from Brooklyn. No, no one was from the Upper East Side, but we had our writer's room in Soho. And it was just so much fun to be in this group of people. So I think I really want to write for TV again just because – I like to. that camaraderie. Yeah. Wait, so you wrote it, you starred in it, and you did you direct it? No. no you pro- I produced, produced yeah, it. but I didn't direct. That's in, that is crazy. I don't so think I want to direct. I don't it's not for me. It's too too technical. I could barely like I had a panic just watching you guys set up all the ring light here. Yeah, so did I. Like I can't <laughs> like, do technical still shit. That. No, I'm just I can't I can't I don't know like technical things. But you do have a creative eye that would be I, interesting I do, to I see. I do, I do, like and I feel view. like, yeah. I I wrote a movie that my agent was like, I think you should try directing, and I just, it's not that I'm scared. I just am lazy to learn all the lighting, all the stuff, and framing the thing. I don't want to learn. It's not that I'm done learning in my life. I just don't want to learn technical things that don't fascinate me. I think you definitely should do tv again not that you asked my opinion but i I, every time i'm with you i feel like someone is coming up to you and like asking about odd mom out you're always like it's not coming back stop it's not coming back (laughs) well my the movie i'm doing is the same world like it's definitely the the milieu i wrote it yeah i wrote it in the fall i'm like in this fundraising shit that you're doing it's such a pain in the ass because i i feel hookery and i do think women have a harder time i hate it you really do feel that way yeah i do my dad like thinks it's like you know a fallacy i'm like no, no dad, he's it's wrong real sorry mr purper scott scott <laughs> no we love scott we love scott i do feel like there's something hookery when you go and chill I but don't it's know. no, but I do want to talk about female. So you're fundraising for the movie right now. Yeah, I, I'm still, I'm still in it. I have like an investor lunch Monday. It's just, I feel like so many guys can get up and say, I, I deserve this. You need to fund this, whatever. You, it, what I can't like, what's really hard for me. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Is like selling this like huge, like being Adam Newman. Like you know, I to them to my team I'm fail like y'all and this still is get be another huge. chance you know like right. this is gonna be huge and this is how big it's gonna be but when I get in front of an investor I'm like okay so here's where we are and I try to like really kind of dial it back because I feel like but I feel like people buy stock in human beings and I would put all in for you like you've got it you. you know and you you're you succinctly eloquently like explained what rodeo was and I was on board. Like I just thought it was super cool and a hole in the marketplace. Can we get some like pep talks of like how you, I don't know. I I want a pep talk from you of like what you do when you walk in, talk to investors. So what I say to investors is uh, that I'm going rogue because since odd mom out, I, that's my, Ro- rodeo vogue rogue is our is my word that i'm trying no to way <laughs> yeah. i love it it's a great word yeah i don't know we're still trying to figure out how it fits in weirdly but. it's almost insane my agent's name is rogue really? but it's r-o-e-g it's a dutch spelling oh my God, it's, a, that's it's amazing. a name yeah but i the studio system in hollywood which i include movie studios and tv channels um even though i had a show 
I, well, I had sold three shows since Odd Mom Out. I've sold three projects and none have been made. So with they're all for different reasons. One, my executives got fired and I was sort of like at square one and that didn't happen. One, uh, you know, I think what, what keeps what I keep coming up against is people saying to me, we love you. You're so uncensored. We just we want to work with you. And then I turn a script and they're like, whoa, this is super uncensored and un PC. And I think that the 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 wokeness I never want to offend anybody and I I'm, I don't when I say like I don't edit myself and I have no filter like I genuinely would never want to hurt anybody right. and it's nothing racial or anything like that it's just like some of the jokes I made I have da- a dark sense of humor right. and NBC's like okay so we don't make jokes about suicide and I was like well this is actually this particular thing was an homage to Harold and Maude one of my favorite movies where they're like trying to kill himself in a million different ways like toaster in the bathtub and all these things but it was a it was it was meant to be sort of like a statement about it it was a character who Mm -hmm. came out as gay comes out as gay at the end of the pilot and I was like well gay youth are so much more prone to suicide and I'm trying to highlight that I'm a gay rights activist I have been my whole life um, and they didn't really like there was just all this pushback of like notes by committee on certain things and notes by, you know, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. Like, I don't really think that art should be I don't think of myself as an artist, but I don't think like a show or a TV or a book, a book, a, you know, a movie, anything should be done by committee. It should be like the the singular sort of voice in your head. Um so I felt like there were everyone is walking on eggshells. Everyone is like metabolizing the politically correct movement in their own way. And I think what winds up happening is there's this institutional sort of vanillization of everything where you can't have any thorns because they're like pumice down. So my pitch to answer your question is I tell this to investors and say, I had all these ideas. Everything is all of the sort of rough edges are pumice down and then I don't like the results. So right. I want to write, I wrote this movie, read it, see if you like it, but this is me. Like this yeah. is, this is warts and all and I don't want it to be pumiced out. I don't right. want that sort of vanillization and I've had good luck with people. I try to let the material speak for itself, um, but you also have to do the pitch of like, there is something where people are curious about New York and city life and they want to have that sort of keyhole into the whole kaleidoscope of New York. Cause I'm also sort of selling, making a movie in New York city, which is very expensive, yep. but everyone is so scared. Everyone's scared to piss everyone off. Yep. And That's so exactly. everyone's sort of like tiptoeing on broken glass. And I feel like you have to just say what you're going to say. And it part of creating something is maybe you'll offend people Right, and I'm Odd Mom Out has a shit ton of offensive stuff that today we would be canceled, but we got away with a lot. And that's actually exactly what I wanted to ask you: is how, like, I feel like there's obviously been like way too much of an overcorrection of the sensitivity in a way that like people can't express themselves; they can't be true to like the expression of art or film or whatever it is. And I kind of feel like it's not that you don't. Of course, no one wants to hurt people and make anyone feel um, like you're not being sensitive. But I do feel like there has to be some kind of desensitization around this like PC-ness. Yeah, especially with comedy. And I'm a liberal. I'm a liberal Jewish New Yorker. Like clearly I'm not like a right wing psychopath, but like I still think that people are overly politically correct and comedy is just going to be so watered down and diluted. Like the whole point is you're laughing. Right. Back to the um, ad being like the sellout advertising thing, because obviously I've been talking to you throughout us, you know, building rodeo and something I found really interesting. We did a customer discovery kind of chat with you and you really are opposed to everything you've been saying, which is basically being a sellout. Um, kind of like linking all your life. I don't mind being a sellout. Like se- it's <laughs> it's hard to be a sellout. If it was easy, everyone would do it. I just think it has to be completely matched with you, with who you are. Mm-hmm. If you're saying, okay, the version of this dress is like this shitty thing that you can buy. You know what I mean? Like the right. watered down, diluted version. I would do the link if it's something that 
is the balsamic reduction of myself. Right. Like it's me in a garment. Right. You know what I mean? I, I think it's more, you just don't want to like dilute it down. Yes. But you, you are very particular. And I think it's something that I learned from my years at Ralph Lauren is, and I know you don't want me to say brand about you, but like it is this attention and like very specific, like nuances of everything around like building a brand that makes it well, so the, special. Yeah. I mean, and, the, I, the, the word brand doesn't give me douche chills when it has to do with a company like Ralph Lauren is perfect example of like a brand that has such a strong identity. It's just when people on the internet are like my brand, I get like sh- toast down the back of my neck of douche chills. Yeah. It is, it is hard. I, the one thing that I really appreciate about when someone does like associate with a brand is a fact I learned during fundraising that creators are the fastest growing small type of business today which is pretty insane like I think like 30 I mean this is scary but 30 percent of little kids want to be like vloggers youtubers when they grow up oh my god um but so like if that is the case if we are if if a creative person an entrepreneur is a, is their own business then a brand is very important to yeah that. but you're a business I'm not a business right like I'm like a middle-aged vampire like I don't I'm not trying to Actually. sell anything you know what I mean yeah, no I know but you are like there's so many facets of you like you have the book and the shows and yeah but I'm not like I, I, I don't know if people always start like a line of things or they're trying oh, no, to no, capitalize no. on shit. Like yeah, I no, don't, you're just like the true, like you get me as I am. Yeah. But also I, I like shit out the stuff that I want to do. I'm not interested in doing like, I don't know, a, like a collab like, yeah. for a, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I get it. And actually, so you were talking about vampire. I do want to know, I want to know like, how your like personal style like your whole inspiration you know I you v- seem very it seems very influenced by New York City yes obviously. I feel like New York is a menage a trois in my marriage like I love <laughs> Harry so much we've been together 23 years he's great but I think if I was like in some rectangular red state in the middle I'd be divorced like we use New York in our marriage like we go to restaurants and theater and burlesque shows or like whatever the fuck we just like filch the joy out of the city and I just think if I were sitting in Idaho or something I would I don't know I just need New York like a lung it's like an organ in my body Okay, but like so ev- everything here there's like you know when I worked on your website we use goth gothica kind of font I just want to know, in, we want to get inside of like where this was inspired from. So actually, funny you should ask. Now I feel like I'm a whore because I sound like I'm name dropping my book. But um, my the, the essay Sell collection it. that I then wrote was called Sprinkle Glitter on My Grave. Yes, I have And it's that. about sort of how morbid my family is. I come from like a crazy morbid family. Like they, t- my parents talk about death all the time. Like they toured cemeteries the way normal people tour colleges. <laughs> they just always were, were talking about it really openly. My mom's family that were Holocaust survivors. And then her mom died of cancer at 47. Her sister died at 49. There's just like a lot of young death in my family. And so I feel like we were we had the happiest life because it was very carpe diem and there was so, it it sounds depressing but it was in fact the opposite it was like order dessert like turn on the music a little louder it, it's it was very much enjoy everything while you can and appreciate everything and it was well before that whole like YOLO. namaste gratitude <laughs> thing or yolo it was very much just like hey appreciate it cuz we're all going to be worms meat yeah. so i felt like I had just such a happy childhood. I felt, I mean, it sounds creepy and Adam's family-ish, but like, so aesthetically, I would say just on like a superficial yeah, sorry, level. I want to get a little superficial. No, but. no, no. On a superficial <laughs> level, I had skin cancer at, in eighth grade, which is crazy I young, realize- but I have a gene. I have a bad, quote, bad gene called CHK2. And I later had a double mastectomy, but it governs breast cancer and melanoma. I've oh, had melanoma oh, so twice. Those were associated. They're wow. associated. I've had melanoma twice, and I was in a wheelchair. Like I had a major surgery. I have I a really, foot long. Really you really saw my scar. No, I didn't see. I well, I, well, think I don't know. I was in a baby. I, I have know. a big fucking scar down yonder, but um, 
So just on that very physical level, I had to stay out of the sun starting in eighth grade. So I don't like lie out. I don't swim. I don't go in the sun. And um, I tended to always like black anyway. And then somehow when everyone was frying themselves and getting tan and being like blonde mm-hmm, and that mm-hmm. was really in, I just decided to like lean into the the Wednesday Adamsness. So yeah, I would like dress up for her as Halloween and Halloween is my favorite holiday. It's my Christmas. And so it's just, I don't know, like Halloween's my whole personality. You guys go all out. Like our with house the cost is with the, with the decoration. Yeah. We give out 5,000 pieces of candy. Like the whole neighborhood comes here. What, there we was like a, candy. I think there was, a- we like the reason Home Depot sold out of all the skeletons was us because like, <laughs> we live two blocks from Home Depot. If only you had been on rodeo you could have made some money on that yes seriously this year i will yes i'll link the skeletons that i don't mind linking to any fucking bats and spiders and anything you want so i love that like you found this like silver lining and inspiration in um a hard like a hardship that you went through that's that's really cool. Well, it went through before my time, but it was definitely, it just permeated. It's baked into my DNA mm-hmm. at this point, literally. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I feel like that was the first essay that I wrote about. It was called Tumor Humor. It's in Sometimes I Feel Like a Nut. That was my editor's idea. She said, you know, I really want you to write a memoir. And I said, memoir? I'm 34. Why the fuck would I write a memoir? And she's like, well, I mean, you already had melanoma. You, you know, you had three kids in four years and then could were told that there was like a chance you could die like Mm -hmm. they thought it had spread Mm -hmm. they had to take out all my lymph nodes but um so that's how I started writing that book was it was the editor's idea so that was like that is an example of taking the shitty thing and doing the silver lining but I mean I had I did have like a really easy happy childhood I would say like I wasn't wasn't you were hardships. Blessed. I was hashtag blessed for shit. Sure. <laughs> what is something that you like dream of kind of knocking off your bucket list? I really want to finish this movie and get it made next year. That's sort of my main That's goal. Your list. Yeah. Well, hopefully I won't kick the bucket at 49, but no, no, but no. definitely want to do that. And probably other movies too. I, I like the idea of a TV show again, but, um, into, well, first of all, we're in a writer's strike. So yay WGA. Hopefully that will be settled, but um, I do like the idea of a TV show, but I think the pendulum has to swing the other way a little bit. I'm happy just doing my movies independently and saying what I want to say and having it be, you know, because with movies, at least you have some control. It's just, you make it, it comes out. It's not, you know, something where you need a network to yeah. distribute it. Can you tell us anything about like, I don't know anything about the movie? Um, it's like a New York ensemble comedy. I really just love the eclecticism of the city and it's just about one block. So it could be, you know, that's what's cool is you could do it over and over again on mm-hmm. all these different streets. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not like really the Wait, plan, That reminds but... me of the cover of and of New York Mag. Oh, yeah. Where all you were on the it cover. It was so much it was fun. like such a I was 175th, 175th of the cover. There were well, 75 of us because um, someone came up to me and was like, hey, cover girl, <laughs> she was just on the cover of New York Magazine. I'm like, slow your roll. No, but I you- was tiny. You had to look for me. I was in the N. Okay, well, which that was cool would, placement. I, would, I was happy that about that. Would end. be like goals. I don't know. You know, you've I done something. I was right so happy with that. It was the coolest day. And the I loved it on so it. much. Oh well, so okay. So for those of you who haven't seen it, it's an artist called um, Pal Cass who does okay. layers. It's it looks like all seventy five of us were on one street corner, but in fact, it was heats of ten. Um, so my heat was like. Senator Chuck Schumer, Paul Rudd, two drag queens, and Tom Brown. Oh. So we were all walking around. They had like um, sort of like battleship. They had an X and Y axis with numbers and letters. And they would say, okay, Jill, go from like B2 to A4. And you walk and they, he would take your picture and then digitally did a, comp- a composite of all those people. Oh my gosh. And the result is, it's actually pinned on my Instagram. It's the coolest, funniest thing. So yes, it's actually a I great metaphor framed. I do I have it framed it's a great metaphor for my movie except it's not it doesn't have 75 people it's more like 20 but um because it's really more zoomed into their life but oh, as cool. a snapshot I felt like that was such a great thing to be a part of I absolutely loved it and I love New York magazine and, and I read it cover to so cover every New York week too and you 
Yeah, you you just are. All I couldn't the New York function kids. anywhere else. I don't know how to drive. I just yeah, I'm I'm definitely a real New Yorker, but I love London. Okay, I feel like I've heard some like f- fun, cool inside see inside the scene stories from growing up when you were in New York City. I don't know. Like I feel like there was like an Andy Warhol. Story. Oh yeah, he was my next door neighbor on Sixty Sixth Street. Yeah, I want to hear like I don't my know, mom's a, in the diary. Um, a story or two. The, he, we just saw him every single day. I was in my little uniform, and he would be walking his dogs. And someone said, because a lot of my friends knew he was my neighbor, and we would see him all the time. I mean, every day. And someone said, after he had died, the diaries came out, and they said. I think your mom is in the dark because he's like every day I see this incredibly chic woman with her little daughter in a uniform who lives on my block. So it's us. Um, Yeah, but we didn't know him. And of course, my dad's kicking himself that he didn't ask him for a portrait of my mom. Um, He definitely would have done it. I don't think they could have afforded it, but he might have. I don't know. Might have worked with them as a neighbor, a neighborly discount. Yeah. Yeah. But it's wild. Your mom could have been amused for all you know. Yeah. It's really my childhood was so crazy like I look back now I was roaming around at eight years old there was no such thing as cell phones I would take the the bus the public bus I now call it the loser cruiser because it's so slow but I used to take the public bus everywhere I took it to school I took it to the tower records record shops were a big deal when I was little Mm -hmm. they still are downtown I mean not like in the day it was tower records was the coolest and I would spend my allowance on the new Yaz record but um Sisters of Mercy, whatever. But I would just like bash around New York alone. And they, my parents had no fucking clue where I was. My kids, I have like They're the like, cell phone location services for all my kids. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Sadie's 20. I still too. know where She's she is. Like, I'm always checking on my little ducks. I little love it. <laughs> like, yeah, I love it. It makes me feel so much safer. Somehow I wasn't like murdered. I don't know. Okay. And then the last question, and you probably don't, like you have so many dream emails, but I love hearing like, if there were an email that were to land in your inbox tomorrow, like what, like what could you dream of that would be the best email? Like what's going to make Oh God. Your- I guess like, hi, I want to fund your entire movie. Yeah. Like, let's just do this. That was, <laughs> that was my answer too. It's like a all business. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I feel like my personal life is, is like totally settled at my age. Like mm-hmm. it's great. And, and my kids are older so I can sleep, you know, like it would just probably be a work thing. Well, your view on life is always so refreshing. And so, you know, I could ask questions. My view that we're all going to die and we should enjoy it while we can. (laughs) I mean, we are, right? So if you really boil it down, it's like that's really the only way to look at things. And thank you. I could ask you a million more questions. No, you're the best. another day. I could talk to you all day. Um, And thanks for hosting us. Of course. Thank you.